Let's get into it. Who is trying to destroy the country? That is the question that we are analyzing today because that's something that Joe Rogan kept bringing up throughout the entire podcast of him and Riley Gaines sitting down together. He just kept bringing it up. If I was someone who wanted to destroy the country, he kept saying. And I decided, let me get all these clips together and let's really dig deep into what he's talking about. So we got four Rogan clips for you guys and then we got 10 other clips that are gonna analyze exactly what he was talking talking about. So we're going to be talking about who is trying to destroy the country or more so how are people controlled? How is the public controlled? So we're going to be analyzing that and going through some of the works of Saul Alinsky because it's so important to know about Saul Alinsky. Then we're going to be talking about how are people controlled through companies? How are companies controlled? Then we're going to hear Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, straight from his mouth. And I don't know what we would call him. We'll just go with the term demon elite. OK, yeah, just right at the top, demon delete. And then we're going to be touching on something Joe Rogan touches on, which is China, TikTok and cell phone towers. I know, I know, I know you can already think of what I'm talking about, but apparently China is able to sell cell phone towers to people. And again, just like their farmland, they're positioning them in very interesting places. So we're going to be talking about that. And then the last thing we're going to touch on is a woman who was attacked by protesters. That woman is Riley Gaines. And when you hear what happened to the people who attacked her, that's another topic that we'll have to explore because it doesn't make any sense what happened to these people or lack thereof. So let's just get into that really quick. Don't forget about IamCoachColin.com. 14 clips, by the way, for you guys today. Uh, we got anti-mainstream stuff, presidential mugshot stuff. We got anti-mainstream, public enemy number one, stop worshiping celebrities, cancel Hollywood, soul not for sale, of course. Discount code is IamCoachColin, all capital letters, all one word, one L in the name Colin. Let's get into this first clip. From the public to companies who controls how we think and what we think let's get into it. really look at what's going on around the world like you said have jobs and families they have their heads down they're not they don't yeah. look at the outside noise i think it's waking a lot of people up um which is a good thing that's yeah. the beauty of a democracy really uh, the american republic is having the people as the power we we do have the power and i feel like we're we're engaging those people yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's enough people that are realizing that this whole system is like completely fucked and that it's really just about money and power and control. And they use all these social issues as, uh, you know, it's like a galvanizing force to get whatever their financial agenda is pushed through. That's all it is. Like when the Biden administration is talking about DEI and all this, it's just, just tied into banks. It's how they can fund businesses and give them loans. Exactly. If you have more people that are this, we'll give you more of that. And it's just a way to control businesses. And the whole thing is just all about money. It's, it's all a gigantic con game. And the more, like I said, if I was a fucking tinfoil hat guy, <laughs> if I was thinking <laughs> this is someone trying to destroy the country, this is how I would do it. I exactly. would have people willing to vote for their own demise, not advocating for freedom, if that freedom gives freedom to the people that are opposed to them. We're so stupid and closed-minded, we're willing to burn it all down just take to silence people. Freedom. Right, take away everyone's freedom. Because I don't want that person who disagrees with me to have freedom crazy and when you put it that way it's exactly it's, what's happening it is exactly what's happening and it's n not the case when i was a kid when i was a young guy like you could like i had friends whose parents were conservative and my parents were hippies and they hung out together everybody right. would go to dinner together like no one cared yeah there's no more gray area so it seems they could talk about stuff you know like they could have Forget agreements it. of what reagan was good at like there was like conversations well you know one thing reagan really did good like my fucking dad was saying that like yeah. the, watching these people today it's like you're the orcs are fighting against the hobbits like this is crazy very Everyone, true so opposed it's like so polarized and again if i was from another country and i was trying to ruin america and i was like how could i do this that's how i would do it i would yeah. do it this way yeah and then i would do it through social media and i would have the democrats almost universally control social of media course they do. except this one wild african-american <laughs> 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 this one wild genius dude decides to buy twitter and then amazing amazing if he didn't do and he is questionably controlled. I know a lot of you out there do not trust Elon Musk. And I understand completely. It's hard for me to trust him at times. Hired someone from the WEF wearing Satan costumes on Halloween. If you look into his mother, that's a whole other mind blowing thing. So he did some good. He did. But when you really look into him, you're like, oh, I don't know about this guy. Let's move on to the next clip. Joe Rogan. He's talking about now. 
uh, TikTok spyware and why China is selling cell towers in the U.S. Let's get into that real quick. You, if you talk about gender issues, anything, now, I can report this... like a factual, mm -hmm. real story that had happened, saying nothing outlandish, nothing, um, and it's deleted. Now again, let's go back to my theory that someone's trying to destroy the country. If I was the Chinese government and I was in control of a social media platform that's the most addictive and the most used by young kids, I would have as much confusion on there as possible. And I would have as much men of with course. beards and lipsticks and long nails telling you that all your kids are going to be trans and have that shit everywhere and of never course. take it down. And anyone who combats this, anyone that like starts making sense and resonates with people, get them out of here. Just get them the fuck out of here. This is a propaganda machine. And they're laughing the whole time. And it is owned by China. And it is some of the most fucking troublesome spyware that they've ever examined. When guys have back engineered the, the Twitter code, the, 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 the fucking coder guys have gone over that, they were like, oh my God, this is crazy. <laughs> this is the most invasive we've ever seen. It has access to your keystrokes. So like say if you are using TikTok and then you're also like sending emails, it's gonna know what your, your emails oh, are. Crazy. It's gonna know, it's gonna be able to listen to your, your voice. It's gonna be able to videotape you. It's going to have access to all sorts of aspects of your phone. Not necessarily saying it's going to use those things, but it's but going it to have the access to it. All that's in there. Now imagine a scenario where China attacks Taiwan. China attacks Taiwan, and all of a sudden we're in this weird proxy hot war with China, as well as a weird proxy hot war with Russia. And then China starts fucking with the phones. All these people that have TikTok on their phones. How many accounts are there? How many how many different no people can they target that have children? And then these people are high level p political people. Right. How many people that are in board meetings? How many people that are coming home on their phone having conversations in private with their wife about the real problems that we have right now with corruption and the Biden laptop is real and th th that kind of shit. Right. They're they're gonna have those all those recordings. They're gonna literally be able to listen to anybody they want. They've paid people. What they've done is really fascinating. They've gotten like high speed internet routers and cell phone routers and they sell them cheaper and so people buy them and right. they and they've already found that some of these have third-party accessibility right and they're putting them near like nuclear facilities the Chinese people like, like we'll sell you these cell phone towers cheaper and just put them over there where you fucking test jets <laughs> and we're like wow would it save some money what a great idea and, <laughs> and it's true I looked into it. It's actually true. We'll explore it more. But I, right now, I just want to say to you, I'm going to move on to the next clip. But what do we have so far in terms of what Joe Rogan's bringing up? We have social issues, which I guess you could call those. I don't want to say civil rights because I don't want I don't even want to link BLM and the LG whatever movement to civil rights. But you know what I mean? Social issues he's bringing up. Right. So those organizations. Then we have banks. Then we have other governments in China, social media. So it's like, who who is connected to all of this stuff? It'll become clear as we keep going. And to answer the question that he asked, how many accounts do do are there of uh, just American users? TikTok, 130 million, just, just so everybody knows. And when you have an account, you right there, when you have an account and you sign up, to all that spyware and stuff and you agree you actually sign up your router which signs up anyone who's connected to that router so you have an account your kid has an account your phone is now being uh, in question is getting tampered with your laptop their laptop mom's laptop everybody buddy who comes over and says what's your wi-fi everybody's exposed just so you guys know we're going to move on to the next clip where rogan is talking about the protesters who harassed Riley and allowing chaos. Let's get into that. It's so crazy. And that's just the San Francisco's fallen. Oh, beyond. I was in San Francisco. I mean, that's that's really like again. If I was going to ruin a country, that's how I would do it. I would tell the children everyone's amazing, and that assault you did that was warranted. And I know how deeply Congrats. traumatic that must have been for you. So here's some counseling because you need counseling. You need to be able to talk about it. So for further fuel your narcissism and get involved with someone who constantly wants to talk about you all day. Here's some counseling. Let's talk about you. Great, I really need to focus on me. And then more, <laughs> we'll talk more about you and how amazing you are that you'll hit this lady who said that men shouldn't be able to compete with women. Fucking duh. Yeah, and then there's nothing that can be done about it. Nothing, zero. So which is why it's hard like for us, and when I say us, I, I really just mean sane people. I'm not making this conservative versus, you know, Republican versus Democrat type thing. Um, it makes it harder for us in this space to, to push back when, um, 
we have district courts or our, our Department of Justice that really is corrupt. It, it's incredibly um, two tiered. Yeah. Um, this so, Fannie Willis thing is awesome, though. Yeah, right. Isn't I it? love it. Isn't it just? It's fun watching her get sassy well, when she's getting questioned, too. And, and that's, like, and that's so telling, right? When she starts <sighs> freaking out and yelling, and it's like, babe, if you just wanted to be this or to have this guy be your like booty call or vice versa. Yeah, you're not supposed to hire him. No. What the fuck? <laughs> like, no. How obvious is that? Also, you can't say that you fucking paid for everything in cash. Like, what? <laughs> Imagine that. Like, this is what I was at. Right. This is I'm going to get him. I'm going to get yeah, him right here. that'll work. I'm going to tell him I paid it all in cash. Sorry, no records. <laughs> all in cash. Where'd you get the cash? I had cash. I just Where'd you it. get the fucking cash? You got $50,000 later on? That's cool. Who does that? But they do that because they know there's a chance of it working. Not really. Wait, well, I think she thought the system is more rigged than it is because I think most people have never been exposed to national attention and you no. can speak to this. Exactly. They have no idea what the pressure like that you've experienced. Like right. you've experienced some, at a young age a, a, as a person who had no desire to be famous other than be a great athlete. Out of nowhere, you get hit with this barrage of attention where you're on Fox News and this and that and newspapers and, and some people are labeling you in the horrible, most horrible way and some people are, we're proud that she's standing up for women in sports and you got this conflict and you're in the fucking center of it. Right. And you got crazy people who rush the stage and hit you and the cops say we can't do anything that d doesn't show us as an ally to that community like that's not even america like where are you? that's la la land they're living in the willy wonka chocolate factory those people are out of their fucking minds the willy wonka chocolate factory sounds better than it sounds way the willy wonka chocolate factory that's exactly where it is it's in la la land so now with those we're going to move on to the very last clip from rogan at least and allowing chaos blurring the allowing chaos and demonizing order and then blurring the lines of everything especially between what is a man and what is a woman who is allowing all of this who is the body that is allowing all of this to happen and they don't even touch on the border i mean you can touch on the border and i mean who's responsible for that right so last clip is uh liberal media owns everything the government and the narrative they own the media, the government, and the narrative. So let's get into that last clip. Let's go. And what they see in all the mainstream, which if you had to like make a list of all mainstream media, whether it is newspapers, uh, magazines, television channels, what's the ratio of liberal to conservative? Is it like 10 to 1, 8 to 1? What is it? I mean, probably about right, especially if you're looking at a lot of the local yeah. local outlets, local papers, right? Like there's a ton more liberal outlets, I think, from, you know, mainstream media like we have CNN and we have Fox. Um, but in terms of who controls the media, definitely. Yeah. It's I mean, pro again, probably 10 to 1. I don't know if I want to destroy the country. And I was some if evil person did. from another planet or wherever. And I had my tinfoil hat and I was looking at this, like, I would say, well, this is a good way to do it. Like, just control all the media and have all the media say all these things like life-saving, gender-affirming care. Say those statements a lot and, you know, trans rights and th this administration exactly. is committed to trans rights. Oh, trans rights. That's important. Yeah. And, like, everybody else is a Nazi, so you got to be on board I want to know, you know, I hear all the time trans rights are human rights. Literally, what right do you or I possess that a trans person or someone who identifies as trans doesn't possess? It's a good point. They, I've, they I've never heard I've, exactly, they have extra ones. but they honestly, it's so true. Like the whole, exactly, like the whole like idea of all the like DEI affirmative action stuff. Like, we are living in a time the most diverse and inclusive as a na inclusive as a nation we have ever been. Yet people are still acting like this is the most oppressed they've ever been, which shows you truly like these people aren't happy with themselves. Like, if you have to demand what someone else calls you to feel affirmed. You're, you're clearly not secure enough with yourself. And I'm not going to affirm that. If you don't even know what you are, you expect me to know what you are? No way. <laughs> you don't even know what you are. Well, it's a compliance thing. But it's like, look, there's always going to be people taking advantage of any sort of discourse, any sort of like uh, open subject of discussion that's hot on everybody's mind, which is whether it's race or any – when it's race, you're always going to have race hustlers. Of you're course. always going to have these Al Sharpton type characters that slide on in and they act as a spokesperson and, you know, and there's always going to be business behind that. Like Jesse Jackson had like a whole business behind that. Of course. And th th you're always going to have these folks. They're always going to have these folks that, you know, maybe provide some good, but also make a lot of money. And they're, 
they're they're at the forefront of all these things. And you're going to have that with trans rights. You're going to have that with gay rights. You're going to have that with everything. You're always going to have some people that capitalize on something and they interject themselves into it and they use it to like stir people up. And, and they always call people either racist or transphobic or homophobic. And they use all those pejoratives. You're always going to have those people. But we have to learn how to ignore those morons. We have to learn how to just recognize like oh, that person. And honestly, like what I've realized, because again, like initially taking that first step it was hard for me to read a lot of the things that were written and like because <laughs> she does say like a lot you know i noticed someone in the in the comments they're like they're like thank you for not saying like every three seconds and i was like do i or i don't i didn't even really realize but she says it a lot it stands out stands out a little bit it's hard to get rid of but you got to work on it now the last thing owns the media controls the narrative so who 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 is the connecting factor between all of these now we're going to move on to um some of the works of saul alinsky i just want you guys to hear rule seven rule eight and rule 12 and we'll go through that let's start with rule seven saul alinsky's work let's go rule number seven the thing is never the thing according to alinsky that's a direct quote the thing is never the thing you sometimes find yourself wondering, what's, what's going on in the culture? What's causing all this? Is it about justice for George Floyd? Is it about ending police brutality? Is it about ending racism? Is it about equality? Is it about trans rights? It's none of the above. Again, Alinsky said the thing is never the thing. The idea is to obfuscate the issues by continually moving the goalposts. Keep your enemy frustrated in his search to find out what it is that you want. Don't give him the end game that he wants. Keep him on his heels. Don't be reasonable, but continually accuse your opponent of being unreasonable. When he meets your demands, make more demands. When he meets those, make still more. That's what you do. Senator Tim Scott was in discussions with Senate Democrats about the so-called Justice Act. And Scott said this, I offered to include an amendment for every concern that was presented by Democrats. They offered zero and walked out. That's Saul Alinsky. I'm sure they weren't, they weren't ready for Tim Scott to say, okay, I agree. All right, good. Then they turn right around and make more. That's the way it works. Very, very interesting. The thing is never the thing. And I think we've seen that over the past four years. I think we've been seeing that four, five, six, seven. <laughs> it's been a while, but you keep on seeing that the thing is never the thing. And this is how you know it's because, and Jordan Peter called this out. Jordan, Jordan Peterson called this out the last time he was on Rogan. He's like, it's interesting. He goes, what do they want? And he was talking about climate change. And he was saying, he's like, you have to be wary of people who say that you have to give me all the power and I'll fix things. Now, you notice that. They want all the power and then they'll fix it. So it's not really about climate. It's not really about trans rights. It's not really about Black Lives Matter. Every single instance that I just brought up, you can look and see that there is a class of people, a group of people, who feel like they should just have control. And also, what you see is that they feel as though you should have less control. Also, that you are the problem. You are, it's you, you as a white person, it's your fault that black people are going through the plight that they're going through. You as a cis male person, also usually white because it's easy to pick on white people, you're, you're the reason why you have the trans blood on your hands every time you don't embrace these people. When it comes to climate change, everybody, it's you who decided to drive your car and have your gas stove and you don't care about the environment. Greta Thornburg, Thunberg, you know, you've taken away her childhood. It's your fault. And then she leaves on a private jet. It's not about the thing. The thing is never the thing. It's about power. You can see it every single time. So that's rule seven. Let's go on to rule eight. Again, this gentleman's name, because I love what this guy does, Larry a Alex Totten. If you go over to his page and you're watching any of his stuff, please comment. Hey, you should do an interview with Coach Colin at me at Coach Colin. Tell him because I reached out to him recently. I'm waiting for a response. I really want to do an interview with, with this guy because I think you guys could get some valuable, my, myself included, and get some valuable knowledge out of this guy. Let's move on to rule eight. Rule number eight, seize power. 
This is done, as I say, by presenting yourself to the solution to the problems that you create. Do you remember, do you remember what Biden's deeply dishonest campaign slogan was about? Unity. Unity. They're burning down whole cities. They're causing riots in the streets and they're going, oh, well, look at all this that's happened because of our political opponents. Look at what Christians and white supremacists and Republicans and MAGA hat wearing people are doing. You do it and then you present yourself as the solution. We'll bring unity. This is Adolf Hitler to a T. This is Adolf Hitler to a T. Alinsky says radicals must remain flexible and opportunistic and say anything to get power. That's a direct quotation of Alinsky. Interestingly enough, I, um, I, I don't remember which news agency it was. I want to say it's Reuters, but perhaps not. Ran an article a few years ago in which they said, why do conservatives hate Saul Alinsky so much? Are you kidding me? Man writes in his book that he's he's wants to acknowledge Satan. Oh, excuse me. It wasn't Satan. It was Lucifer. <laughs> and the man says, do anything to get power. And you have media running inter interference for Saul Alinsky to say, what's wrong with these people? Why wouldn't they like him? He's like reading Mark Twain. Reading, reading Saul Alinsky is, is just like reading Dave Barry back in the day. Hardly. Then, once in power, rule number, number nine, ideologically reform the levers of popular coercion. By popular coercion, I mean the instruments of power. So I just let that run a little long. I want to jump over to rule 12, but seize power. That's exactly what I was talking about. I didn't even realize that he went into it in depth the way I just did, but seize power. That's exactly how this goes. Every single thing. When you look at it, it's to seize power. All the cars must be electric. Why? Well, because that's how you seize power. They're going to be able to control the cars. For some reason, people look at, when, when you bring that up, people look at you with this, this stare of like, come on now. Like, what are you serious? It's like, yeah, that's, that's what's obviously going to happen. All the cars are going to be electric. <laughs> Everyone's going to be dependent on the grid. And then they're going to say, listen, um, cause climate just no driving on Tuesday. And we're all going to go, no, 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 of course I'm going to drive on Tuesday. And they're going to go, yeah, you know, just for your safety, all the cars are off. Yeah. We just turned your cars off. Of course. That's a thing. Like what? Of course it's a thing. Tesla's update randomly. They'll just, you don't have to bring your car into a Tesla dealership. There's no Tesla dealerships. If they got to do an update to your car, they just do the update. Again, New York. New York was a, such, a, such a great example. You know, uh, Mayor Adams. We want to start tracking people's meat consumption. What are you talking about? Because you're eating too much meat. I am? How much are you eating? That's never the question. It's never the question about how much Bill Gates is in his <laughs> private jet, how much Greta herself is in her private jet, how much gas they use, what their, what their footprint is. It's never about that. It's only about you. You're the problem. I've brought it up so many times. I'm like, why don't we just run a test where all of the billionaires stop using their jets? And all, all of them. Stop doing all the things that supposedly impact climate. And let's see where we're at then. And if we're still, if it's still, I, I have, I have a good feeling it'll come. I think, I think it'll calm down nice and slow. But it doesn't even need to. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying anything. But I'm saying it doesn't need to. Climate goes up and down. We're not going to get into that. But I'm just saying every single thing that they tend to bring up tends to bring more control. Look at trans rights right now. Dave Chappelle brought this up before anybody else did. Dave Chappelle said, he's always, how did trans people get ahead of black people in the oppression line? We've been waiting in line for so long. How'd you guys jump the line? It's because it's not about the, it's just about the power. Whoever's associated in the group, it's just about getting power. That's why BLM got $100 million 
And they didn't build a community center in Chicago. <laughs> they didn't say free therapy for all traumatized black youth because you've been through so much. They didn't offer that. They could have. They could have done something. They could have just focused on Chicago, New York, the, all of the craziest places that we hear about day in, day out. Philadelphia could have concentrated there. They didn't do anything. What did they do? How, more power for themselves. Employing relatives to million dollar salaries, mansions, houses, all sorts of stuff. And now you don't even hear from them anymore because it's just about power. That's it. You see it in the feminist movement as well. A lot of times when you see these clips and videos of people talking, let's move on to rule 12. You see these clips of people talking. Usually a lot of women, it's not all women, but a lot of women are talking about being above men. They want Jordan Peterson brings this up all the time. They want to be in positions of power. And Jordan Peters is like, why not bricklayers? Why don't we even that out first? And every single time he brings it up to a woman interview, they go, <laughs> I'm not bricklaying, Jordan, obviously. Uh, let's move on. Rule 12. Rule number 12, create a sense of ongoing eminent threat from an exaggerated or fictitious enemies. An ongoing eminent threat. The Trotskyists, the Jews, the fascists, evangelical Christians. Have you seen the way the Biden administration, the FBI, has been going after the Catholic Church? Big time. Biden giving a speech and saying the greatest threat to America is white supremacists. Where are all these people? Climate change. Climate change, and as I pointed out on an earlier podcast on here, the, uh, the 1991 um, academic paper, which I've discussed in discussing the World Economic Forum, uh, called The First Global Revolution. This is what informs groups like the World Economic Forum and various others. The First Global Revolution said, what we have to do is create an enemy, a noble lie in the platonic sense. Read Plato's Republic, he talks about the noble lie. That is a lie that we unite the people uh, around, but they don't know that it's actually a lie. And in the first global revolution, 1991, they say, we've determined that the real, the real great lie is to tell people that it's climate, it's the ecology. Because that's something that goes across the board that everybody can worry about. It doesn't matter whether you're, you're a, a Muslim, whether you're a communist, whether you're, whether you're Hindu, what your nationality, we can all unite around that. And they said that, that needs to be the thing we tell everybody. Ongoing threat. Now I want you, now what he said is like perfect, but also I want you, you think about some ongoing threats. I was trying to write some down just now. White people, that's an ongoing threat. <laughs> whiteness so much so that the term white guilt has been so popularized you know white people should be guilty for just existing you know you didn't do anything but still it's still your fault just, just apologize to the point we see like white people like there's been videos of like white people kissing black people's like feet on their knees and stuff like all sorts of weird stuff uh cops ongoing threat i mean that's how defund the police became popularized because the threat was cops Right. Because of what happened with George Floyd. And now all of a sudden that case is being appealed and there's all sorts of things where it's coming out and you see his tox to toxicology toxicology. Is that how you say it? His reports of what was in his bloodstream. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, was it what actually did him in? Now people are very unsure as you look into that case. Nazis, the elusive Nazis, you know, you know, those Nazis, Jordan Peterson or Ben Shapiro. He was branded as a Nazi at one point. These elusive, invisible enemies, the racists, which, of course, are white people. Black people can't be racist. You know that we all know that. And now and today, I mean, before and before that, it was black death. Black people are getting killed by cops. You know, now it's trans death. Where if you stand up and say anything about anything that's going on with the gender affirming care or anything like that, you are being threatened with having blood on your hands, trans blood on your hands. <sighs> but in reality, you're just trying to protect kids because some kids are too impressionable and they don't actually know what they want and they don't actually know what they're doing. So you think a lot of people just think, nah, let them wait a little bit. 
let them wait a little bit so they can figure out life a little more. And when it comes to Black Death, if you really wanted to get after Black Death, everybody would be going after Planned Parenthood. Because Kanye West pointed out a long time ago, there's like 2,000 black babies that are killed every single... I think, I want to say that he said every single day. And I know Kanye is not a great source of information, but if you look into it, you know, I've brought it up before. Gun store, liquor store, Planned Parenthood. That's how it goes in the hood. You can find one everywhere. They're, they're always in walking distance. So if you really want to go after Black Death, maybe you should start there. I don't know. Talk to BLM. BLM should be able to help with that. They have the money, right? Anyway, let's move on. Now we're going into companies. So that, And all that just, just to say, that's how the public is controlled. Through things like that. Through through the BLMs, through through the the um, they, Klaus Schwab once said that these organizations they direct people in regards to letting them know what they should be concerned about. That's what BLM did. BLM showed you what to be concerned about. The trans activists today are showing you what you need to be concerned about, and it may not work on you. But there are a lot of people where they go, oh, that is a problem. I know it's a problem because I see it on every major network and I see it constantly talked about. And all of those mega people, they're against it. And I don't want to be one of them. I want to be a good person. So I'm going to be on board with that. That's literally how it happens. So that's how the public is controlled through those organizations, BLM, LGBTQ movements, uh, trend, like all of that stuff is how the public is persuaded into believing certain things and acting on certain things and voting certain ways. So again, everything that Joe Rogan brought up, who's connected in all this? Who pushes this stuff the most? Who is it? <laughs> anyway, let's get into companies now. We got Patrick Bet David here. He's talking about something called the ESG score, and this is how companies are controlled and swayed. Let's get into it. Right there, and let's see what comes up. Uh, 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 underneath Robert Schwartz, just write ESG. Right next to Robert Schwartz, write ESG. Let's see what pulls up. So there is a... Uh, what was the second name? Zevin? Uh, it's that one right there. He died in 2006. That Wikipedia right there, go down. That one right there. Yeah, zoom in. Zoom in. So this is... Uh, he was a U.S.-born economist and a stockbroker. He was an early advocate of socially responsible investing. He was also actively campaigned for civil rights uh, against the Vietnam War, the use of nuclear weapons. He actively participated in organizations such as American Veterans Committee, Americans for Democratic uh, Action, saying in 1989 he founded uh, econ Economist Against the Arms Race, now called Economist for Peace and Security. So the story says how these guys originally felt capitalism was a problem and the right way of doing it is to force businesses to be socially uh, uh, conscious of what they're doing to keep mon uh, give money back. Obviously, they're very left on what they're doing. So, the story was there. You know, this is uh, uh, thirty trillion dollars of money being invested back into the into people. Thirty five trillion dollars being invested back into the world that we live in. And it again, it sounds very convincing. Okay, where a lot of people are falling for it. I remember when we were selling our insurance company, uh, and we were going with. Uh, Folks at Hulahan Loki and we're sitting with buyers. Okay, you know the okay. process. You've gone through this yeah, before. And so we're sitting down. It's like, oh, so tell us your, uh, I'm like, so what does your company look like? Well, our hardest, ch biggest challenge we have is we have a 1,000 investment bankers that work with us, but uh, uh, only 5% are African Americans, 6% are uh, Hispanics, and we're really having a hard time with that. I said, oh, really? I said, you know, our DI score is this and this, this, that. And they're asking about the DI score, right? I said, okay, yeah. You know, we're 54% Hispanic. You know, we're 51% women. And, you know, the average agent is 34 years old. And you see, like, their faces. The, the, the lighting Their up, faces probably. is like, oh, this could, uh, this is, so you guys have a very, so, and then they started talking, you know, uh, 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 how this could impact their DI score. The look on their face, they were more interested on what this is going to do, their DI score in the marketplace. That's right. Than the investment. Oh, of course, which and was this is completely supplied. Yeah. It's a different kind of scoring system, right? right? I mean, it's like ESG scores go into your credit rating. That affects whether or not you can borrow more expensive right. or not, right? So, so a couple things going on here. Okay, so first there was this socially responsible investing movement, and you described it perfectly. That exactly was the goal: use capital as a lever to drive positive social change, or what someone would determine as positive social change. 
The question they skip is, who gets to decide what is positive or not? If these are contested mm-hmm. public policy issues, right. that means they're contested because people, human beings, citizens, disagree about it. And we have to decide what's the way we work out our differences. Is it through force, including economic force, or is it through a process of debate in a democratic body politic? I thought we lived in the latter. Old world Europe, and actually, in fairness, by the way, I just want to say something to be fair about this. For most of human history, that's not how it's been settled. Okay, right. this is a relatively new idea. I mean, it existed in ancient Greece in some sense, but in modern history, this is a relatively new idea. You actually have most questions that were settled through force, either physical force or through other elite intervention. So this American thing we got going on here, this is a departure from history, but that's the experiment that I signed up for, or at least my parents signed up for. I signed up for by being born here. My parents signed up for by coming here. That was the American way. And so to me, that's the first question is who gets to decide what the right answers are. But the second thing is what's going on with ESG right now is different. That is to say it goes beyond what was going on with the sustainable or the socially responsible investing SRI movement. So there, what they were doing was saying, and by the way, when I was a student at Harvard, the endowment at Harvard, you know, some people joke. $60 billion. You know, some people joke around that Harvard is a giant hedge fund with a college attached to it. correct. Right? So what they would do is they would kind of use their capital to divest from Sudan or divest from conflict areas and then take a lot of credit for it and issue nice press releases. That was what socially responsible investing was about mostly is divestment. Okay, take the bad sectors. Pick whatever you think is bad, tobacco, coal, oil, Sudan, cigar- you know, whatever, gaming, mm-hmm. firearms is a big one. Divest. And then hopefully if you divest, that will then cause those companies to change their behavior. What ended up really happening was that we have deep, liquid global capital markets. So if those stock prices go down, for example, or asset prices go down, the inherent worth of the activity, the commercial value of it hasn't changed That just created an opportunity for somebody else to buy it up instead. And so what ended up happening is the guys who want to issue the press releases end up giving up return. The guys who don't care about the press releases would rather stay anonymous end up being the other side of that trade. They just get to buy it at a lower price. And that's why UT's University of Texas's system has outperformed Harvard's endowment because Harvard got out of fossil fuels while the University of Texas didn't over the course of 2022. Mm -hmm. So what the ESG movement does is one step goes one step further than that. And this is where I'm focused, okay? BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, these are three of the largest financial institutions. They manage about $20 trillion, almost as much capital as the U.S. GDP in the hands of three institutions. Mm-hmm. But what they're mostly doing isn't just this socially responsible investing thing through their ESG funds. It's a common misconception. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny part of what they do, like less than 2% or something, okay? Most of what they do is they're actually just providing index funds to the general population, people who think they own the S&P 500, Mm -hmm. who think they own Apple and Nike and, and, you know, whatever, you name the company, Exxon, Chevron, et cetera. But the key is they're not divesting through those funds. They're investing in the whole market. In fact, who are the top shareholders of Disney and Paramount Pictures, of Apple and Microsoft, of Exxon and Chevron? It's the same companies. (laughs) Actually, it's the same large shareholders are the institutions that hold these firms. They're using the money of everyday citizens to do it, but they're changing the behaviors of those underlying companies by voting their shares and by advocating for policies in the boardroom that change the companies themselves. So here it's not divesting from Apple because they didn't do a racial equity audit. It's being invested in Apple and making Apple do a racial equity audit at their company last year that Apple itself did not want to do. Apple's board said, absolutely not. BlackRock and State Street said, "Um, actually, you're going to do it because we're your shareholders and we're the ones that demand it. Now, the funny part is it's not like Larry Fink or BlackRock is the actual shareholder. It's probably most listeners to this program whose money is invested in their funds but don't know that their money is being voted in this direction. So that's the key with the the main where the, where the main action is on the ESG debate isn't the divestment game. Yeah. It's the voting game. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right. So. I just want to get into that real quick. Now, I can simplify this. Uh, all I have to do to simplify it to, for you to really understand is Target, Doritos. Recently, I don't know if you saw what's going on with Doritos. They went woke as well. Bud Light. That's basically what ESG is. Now, not only are they going to change the behavior of what's going on inside the company, it's how the company presents itself, right? So, you might ask yourself, 
And a lot of people have. Why would Bud Light do that? They lost $30 billion. Well, like Vivek was just talking about, now they've put themselves in a good in a good space with companies like BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. So now, if they need to borrow $100 billion at any point, or whatever they need to borrow for whatever they need to do, they got it. Because they've done the bidding of the demon elite. I like that term. I'm going to keep going with that term. They've done the bidding of the demon elite. So now they're good. So that that's why it's like, it, it seems weird. But if I had to put it in a real simple way, how this whole thing works between the demon elite to the people, it's like a wife, husband, and friend, right? Your friend is your friend, right? Your wife's your wife. But let's say your wife doesn't like your friend. You know, she wants you to do something about something that he said the other day. So when you're in front of your wife, you say, hey, man, come on. We accept people of all types here. How dare you say that? And how dare you bring that type of stuff into my house? What's the matter with you, man? Hey, you know what? I think tonight's over. I think it's over, man. Just have a good night. Okay. And your wife is happy. So you keep her happy. So now your household, your company is all good. It's still in good standing. But then you go over to your friend. Later on, you see him at a bar and you say, hey, man, the wife was just pissed. I just had to I had to say all that. You know how I feel, man. You know how it is. That's exactly what Bud Light did with the public, by the way. They did what they did to stay in good standings with the demon elite, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. And then after all of that blew over, kind of blew over for the most part, they turned to the UFC and said, hey, man. Hey, let's let's do some UFC. Hey, Kid Rock, let's let's meet up with Kid Rock a little bit. Let's talk with Rogan. Let's talk with Shane Gillis. Let's get back into the good standing of the people. That's all it is. So it seems like, oh man, it was just this woke woman who like messed everything up. Get out of here. You think someone wouldn't have stopped her before she went and did that whole campaign with Mulvaney? Of course somebody would have stopped her. She has higher ups. They're not just letting her just guide the company. They did it because they needed to do it. So the same thing happened with Target. Target put out all that stuff. Why would they do that? It's evil what they were putting out there. It's evil what they were showing to little kids and getting parents to actually buy. But it helped their score. DEI score, ESG score, all of it is helped. This goes way, it's like, it's, if I had to even simplify it even further, it's like affirmative action on steroids it's like it's like affirmative action just took every steroid that the rock has every single one and they got possessed by a demon that's exactly what it's like it's crazy but that that's how they control companies that's how co companies get controlled now i'm gonna go a little deeper because vivek was talking about how they're gonna force behavior and that is something that's an, a direct quote from larry fink himself ceo of blackrock and just to add in BlackRock, straight, uh, uh, State Street, Vanguard. Do you know who the biggest owners of all of those companies are? The biggest shareholders? Well, of BlackRock, it's State Street. And of State Street, it's Vanguard. And of Vanguard, it's BlackRock. <laughs> and when it's the State Street, they all own each other. So they're actually one massive ultra company that actually are forcing the behaviors of all the other companies. So that's why you're seeing right now this whole push towards, you know, the mermaid, a mermaid being black, you know, when she's been white for years and who cares? It doesn't matter. That's why you're seeing uh, Snow White out of nowhere is like, oh, it's going to be a feminist Snow White. It's like, why? Who cares? Why? Why are you doing this? It's because those companies are forcing the behavior, and you're going to hear it directly from his mouth right now. Let's go. You now make a point of, that's, that's an investment criteria for you. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. 54% uh, of the incoming class are women. We, we added four more points in terms of diverse uh, employment this year. And it, if it, you know, what we are doing internally is if you don't achieve these levels of impact, it, your compensation could be impacted, okay? We're doing the same thing. And so it's just, it, you have to force behaviors. And if you don't force behaviors, whether it's gender or race or just any way you want to say the composition of your team, you're going to be impacted. And that's not just not 
recruiting, it is development, as Ken said. And ultimately, it's still going to take time, but I am just as much shocked as Ken is that we have not seen more opportunities. And we're going to have to force change. So when he says force behaviors, again, he's talking about BlackRock. He's talking about internally. But then you got to think again, who do they control? Well, they control every company that goes public. Every single public, every single public company, the, as soon as they get put on the market, Vivek actually talked about this because people were questioning his uh, ties to BlackRock and having that, that company invest in his companies. And he said it's something that's unavoidable. He goes, the second you become public, they are the first people to buy up the most shares of your company. And they do it with every company. And that's why they have such a uh, such a control on things. So when he says he's going to force behavior, exactly like Vivek uh, Vivek brought up, he's talking about Disney. He's talking about he's talking about uh, Bud Light. He's talking about the company that owns Bud Light. He's talking he's talking about all the companies. That's how companies are controlled. So we've already touched on how the people get controlled, how companies get controlled, which trickles down to the people, and we hear it directly from the demon's mouth himself. Now, <laughs> we're going to move on to another thing Joe Rogan was talking about, and that was China. TikTok mainly. We got Tucker Carlson right now talking about TikTok. We're talking about American TikTok versus uh, Chinese TikTok. And again, this whole thing is just who are the people trying to destroy the country right now? What is all of this connected to? TikTok came out of nowhere to become one of the world's most social, popular social media platforms. But what is it exactly? Is it a PSYOP? Hmm, well, TikTok is effectively controlled by the government of China. But what's interesting is that the TikTok that Chinese residents, children in China get to see, is very different from the one your kids are looking at here. Now, in China, where TikTok is known under a different name, videos like these are very common. Watch. Interesting. The Rubik's Cube Olympics, showering the teacher with adoration, kids who can draw like draftsmen. Now, we saw all of those by registering an Apple device in China, just because we wanted to know what are they watching on TikTok. Now, you know what American kids, your kids are watching on TikTok, stuff like Now, Tucker's about to show, and this is just a great example. He's about to show what's on TikTok you know, for all of us to see. <laughs> and I can't show it to you on YouTube. <laughs> I cannot show you what's on the American TikTok, but I will break it down for you if you'd like. It's a lot of twerking. It's a lot of gyrating. It's a lot of depravity. It's a lot of, hey, check out this person's mom. It's a lot of just, like, back to that word, depravity. It's just a lot of that. <sighs> and I'm sure you've seen it. If you've been on TikTok, if you had it before, maybe you've deleted it since you learned about all the spyware and everything, but I'm sure you've seen it. It's kind of like uh, Instagram, but like hyper, just hyper, hyper Instagram. But instead, it's just five seconds, just just body part, body part, body part, body part, twerk, body part, body part, twerk, body part, face, body part. It's wild. <laughs> um, let's move on to the next part. It's Tucker Carlson again talking about this whole so, there's also a huge genre on American TikTok of videos convincing your kids to get a sex change. Now, none of this stuff comes up randomly. It's curated. It's determined by an algorithm. Now, on Chinese TikTok, there are lots of videos of college graduations, for example. You're seeing those on your screen right now. So in China, TikTok is wholesome, affirming. In the United States, well, it's a driver of social chaos. What's going on here exactly? Nicholas Challing is a former Air Force Chief Software Officer. He joins us tonight. Mr. Challing, thanks so much for coming on. Can this be accidental? 
No, absolutely not. This is something that China has designed from the beginning, first launching Douyin in China with a very different process. First, for kids under 14, you cannot spend more than 40 minutes a day on the application. They know how toxic it is, for, particularly for younger generations, but also they are banning the application after uh, nighttime. That's very important as well. The other piece is that, uh, effectively, the two applications are completely different, like you said, completely different algorithm. What you're going to find uh, on the Douyin application is effectively pushing educational content, historical uh, content, and, of course, science. Uh, that's not an accident. It's really designed to effectively push the rest of the world to become imbeciles. Has the United States ever, in the past, say, five years, acted in its own interest to protect its own people from China ever, anywhere? Have you ever seen that? Or we just sit passively by and allow those? No, it's, it's definitely a perfect example of what you see uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party uh, leading in, in really what is effectively a, a weapon of misinformation and, and really, at the end of the day, uh, is capable of swaying elections as well across the, the world. So, very interesting. And if you didn't know what that was at the screen there, that was um, someone throwing hot dogs and girls trying to catch it in their mouths. And if they don't, it slaps them in the face. So, either way, it's a win for whoever's watching, because that's how TikTok works. Social media in general, but TikTok, again, it's just a hyper version of that. Now, the only reason I bring that up is because Joe Rogan brought up the whole China thing. He's talking about the spyware and everything like that. So, I just wanted to show that. Then we're going to move on to the spyware. This is uh, Senator Hawley talking to the CEO of TikTok. Let's get into it. Before my time expires, Mr. Chu, let me just ask you, your platform, why should your platform not be banned in the United States of America? You are owned by a Chinese communist company or a company based in China. The editor-in-chief of your parent company is a Communist Party secretary. Your company has been surveilling Americans for years. According to leaked audio from more than 80 internal TikTok meetings, China-based employees of your company have repeatedly accessed non-public data of United States citizens. Your company has tracked journalists improperly gaining access to their IP addresses, user data, in an attempt to identify whether they're writing negative stories about you. Why should your, your platform is basically an espionage arm for the Chinese Communist Party? Why should you not be banned in the United States of America? Senator, I disagree with your characterization. Many of what you have said, we have explained in a lot of detail. TikTok is, is used by 170 million Americans. I know, and every love. single one of those Americans are in danger from the fact that you track their keystrokes, you track their app usage, you track their location data, and we know that all of that information can be accessed by Chinese employees who are subject to the dictates of the Chinese Communist Party. That, that why, not, why should you not be banned in this, in this country? Uh, Senator, that is not accurate. A, a lot of what you describe we collect, we don't. And it is 100 percent accurate. Do you deny that repeatedly Americans' data has been accessed by ByteDance employees in China? We built a project that either cost us billions of dollars to stop that, and we have made a lot of progress. And it I hasn't think. been stopped. According to the Wall Street Journal report from just yesterday, even now, ByteDance workers, without going through official channels, have access to the private information of American citizens. I'm quoting from the article. Private information of American citizens, including their birth date, their IP address, and more. That's now. Senator, as we know, the media doesn't always get it right. What, what we have... What we have, uh, but the Chinese what, Communist Party does? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we have, been, we have spent billions of dollars to build this project. It's rigorous, it's robust, it's unprecedented, and I'm proud of the work that the 2,000 employees are doing to protect the data. It's, it, but it's not, it's not protected. That's the problem, Mr. Chu. It's not protected at all. It's subject to Communist Chinese Party inspection and review. Your app, unlike anybody else sitting here, and, and heaven knows I've got problems with everybody here, but your app, unlike any of those, is subject to the control and inspection of a foreign hostile government that has actively trying to track the information of whereabouts of every American that they get their hands on. Your app ought to be banned in the United States of America for the security of this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, when we go back to Rogan with his theory of, you know, someone's trying to destroy the, uh, the nation, you know, the attack within, if you will, who's allowing TikTok? Who's allowing that application to be here? 
who's allowing them to set up shop and do all of these things. Now we're going to move on to um, the cell phone towers because that was happening as well. And then I have some clips that I added. There was a few that I added that I forgot to mention. Um, yeah, you wait till you see those. Let's get into this. <laughs> cell phone towers. China's spying on us using our own cell phone towers. A Lincoln senator believes they could be, and his bill would take the first action of its kind in the nation. Companies would have to remove Chinese-made equipment that could pose a national security risk. As KTV News Watch 7's Andrew Ozaki reports, a Nebraska congressman supports the bill. This is video from a high-def camera on top of cell tower in New York. Great for checking out road and weather conditions, but a state senator and a Nebraska congressman believe it could present a clear and present danger since some of the equipment may have been made in China. Chinese made Huawei equipment atop cell towers near U.S. military bases in rural Midwest is capable of capturing and potentially disrupting highly restricted airwaves used by the military. The use of Huawei equipment in cell phone towers is concerning to our national security. Listen, this is bigger than balloons. The government already restricted some high-tech Chinese-made equipment from being brought into the U.S. and used on communications towers. But federal lawmakers have not provided enough money to reimburse companies, which need to replace some 24,000 pieces of equipment. It is more than $3 billion short of the money it needs to reimburse all eligible companies. Senator Elliot Bolstar says the state needs to act since some of the Chinese-made equipment are on rural Nebraska towers near missile silos. His bill would cut off state funding for any company that uses equipment the feds consider a potential security threat beginning 2025. It would also remove any red tape for companies to remove the equipment. Nebraska would be the first state to take such action. Nebraska dollars must never be used to subsidize anything that endangers the well-being and safety of our country. Some lawmakers express concern over how this would affect rural areas. The federal government should be taking the lead on funding and so withholding our state funds my concern is that we are hurting our rural communities. One Nebraska communications company testified in favor of the bill, no one in opposition. It's our hope that other states take this as seriously as Nebraska. In Lincoln, Andrew Ozaki. So, I was watching this video, and that woman popped up, the one who was concerned with rural communities. And I, I love how Orwellian it is, because, you know, this, this video is from a year ago, because this has been an ongoing problem. It went from cell phone towers, from Huawei, to TikTok, to farmland, and it's all just been happening at the same time. But I, I, I remembered that woman. I was like, who is that lady? Really quick before we get into that, I just want to show you what they're talking about when they talk about these cell phone towers. So a cell phone tower here, right? Triangle cell tower, uh, approximately one uh, uh, third mile away from a missile silo. That's just how they have it set up. And the same thing goes with the farmland. Who's allowing this? Well, the state government's allowing it. So again, back to that woman. I knew her. I knew her when I saw her. I was like, who is that lady? I'm like, I remember seeing her. I didn't show her name. But I was like, hold on a second. Those glasses. I remember those glasses. Now, of course, I talk about how Orwellian it is because in one instance, we're very concerned for the rural communities. And nowadays, because this is how it goes, whoever the enemy is, they just are, and they've always been, and you can't argue it. So now, all of a sudden, there's rural white, uh, rural white rage. Look that book up. I just did a video talking about it. Now they're saying that the rural communities are a problem. They're the most racist, most misogynistic, most sexist, most homophobic, most transphobic. They're a real problem. They are using Donald Trump as a conduit, a conduit to, to rage. That's what they're using him for. They're a big problem nowadays. But back then, she was concerned. But who is this lady? And again, we're talking about who could be trying to destroy things. And I will go down the list again before I play this. But, you know, social issues, banks, other governments, allowing other governments to buy land, you know, sell them, allowing them to have cell phone towers, social media, right, allowing chaos demonizing order, blurring the lines between men and women, owning the media, controlling the narrative. The thing is never the thing, right? Don't be reasonable. <laughs> and this, is a, this clip is perfect. Ongoing threats of white people causing constant divides. Who is responsible for this? Well, let's, let's go on. I, I remembered who this woman was. Check this out. 
Check this out. This is her again. This is something that she does regularly. President, trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. That's what they're saying out there. They're standing in a circle in the rotunda saying that over and over again. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans. This is a three minute clip. We're only one minute in. Here, I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit. Let's go to two minutes in. What do you think she's saying now? Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans people. We love trans people. Trans people belong here. We need trans It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. But that's the woman who is concerned with rural areas. So she wanted to allow China to keep selling these cell phone towers that are near missile silos, nuclear facilities, as Rogan was saying, because she was concerned with the rural communities. The thing is never the thing. That was the rule. Rule seven. Rule seven, I believe. I think that was where he was talking about that. The thing is never the thing. Right now, she's screaming, just filibustering, basically, just chanting for three minutes straight. The thing is never the thing. Don't be reasonable. That was another part of Alinsky's work. This is completely unreasonable. This is a grown woman. She's in the government. She's in a government building. They want to hear her out and hear what she has to say. And she just wants to chant this for three minutes straight. More demands. Even if they gave in, she would have more demands. They would have even more demands. Now, I just want to say really quickly, this is not the first time she's done this. Okay, She's done this many times, this woman. Her, her, name, is, uh, her name is Michaela Kavanaugh. This is her doing it again. This is her doing it again. She just decided to filibuster and just start screaming. Now, let me just go down here because I want, I want to read this part. Okay, This part really stood out to me. From the beginning, Kavanaugh knew she could lose and probably would. She accepted that fact. What she wanted at minimum was to make Republicans suffer for their victory, to deprive them of the mindless ease of pressing a button to vote the party line. If you want to inflict pain upon our children, I am going to inflict pain upon this body. She promised on the floor in February. People are like, is she threatening us? Let me be clear. Yes, I am threatening you. That's her. That's her. That's that same lady just screaming in the halls. So it's like, as we keep on going, it's like, who is allowing all of this? Well, I have to say that every single thing that we've touched on, there is an attack within going on. Even though we were just touching on China and what China's doing, there are people within the government that are allowing them. Even though this woman's talking about trans rights, again, people within are allowing all of this. People within are destabilizing everything. People within are demoralizing people, making them think that they're the, they're the problem, that their white guilt is something that they need to ruminate on, that the fact that they were slaves is something that they need to be ashamed and angry about constantly, and they should never get past it, and they should never just come together as Americans. There's one party that's doing that. There's one party that's doing that, and they keep doing that. And it's through these, through these rules that Saul Alinsky 
taught them so long ago. And yes, he didn't sit down in rooms with them and teach them, but they keep his book like doctrine. And they use these rules constantly. And that's the reason that I'm talking about them, because the more that we talk about them, the more that you'll end up seeing them. You can see it. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure you'll see it. If you learn these rules in and out, you'll, I'm sure you'll see it on the right. I'm sure you'll just see it in politics. But we're seeing it ramp up. We're seeing it ramp up with the left in the past four or five years. Threatening you. So... I just want to just wanted to say that because that woman just stuck out to me really quickly. And uh, now here's a clip of the FBI director talking about possible uh, attacks, cyber attacks. U.S. and its allies sharing their concerns about the threat of a cyber attack by China. They met recently in Munich for a security conference where experts warned they are unprepared. National correspondent Adrian Elnishar explains th what they fear could happen. <laughs> FBI Director Christopher Wray warning U.S. allies and partners the Chinese Communist Party is putting its entire government behind an effort to undermine global security, rapidly developing cyber tools combined with espionage and election interference to do it. The cyber threat posed by the Chinese government is massive. China's hacking program is larger than that of every other major nation combined. China building cyber weapons within critical infrastructure, poised to attack when Beijing decides the time is right. To cut us off from our water or electricity whenever they want, to take control of our phones or our personal data. Members of Congress acknowledge the federal, state, and... Just want to say the thing is never the thing, right? So yeah, there's somebody warning you right now about that whole thing, but again, the thing is never the thing. Better to have someone else to blame, to have white people to blame, to have China to blame, to have anything else to blame. Because what's the result as the, as the attack is looming and as this could happen and that could happen? What is going to be the end result that these people are going to ask for? The power. We're going to need the power. This Listen, their hacking program's huge. We're going to need to see what's going on in your computer 24-7. We're going to need it. I'm sorry. Listen, you don't want China to win, do you? You don't want Russia to win, do you? We got to send that money over. I know it's your hard-earned money, but we have to send it over to Ukraine. You don't want to be part of the problem, do you? The thing is never the thing. And when you look at what the end result is, it's usually more power for who is who is ever in control right now. Just saying. Now, the last thing we're going to touch on is Riley Gaines, the allowing of chaos, the attack that she went through because she decided to stand up for women's rights and women in sports. Let's go. Former University of Kentucky swimmer Riley Gaines was ambushed by trans activists after delivering a speech on saving women's sports at San Francisco State University. She's a 12-time NCAA All-American swimmer and she swam against Leah Thomas. Riley was on the phone with her husband, Louis Barker, while she was barricaded. They both join us now. Welcome to both of you. Riley, I'll start with you. Why were you barricaded and what happened to the people who assaulted you? Um, well, first of all, nothing has happened to the people who assaulted me. The campus police did nothing. The student or the dean of students was there and did nothing. There will be no repercussions unless I have something to do with it. Um, I will be pursuing legal action. These people need to face repercussions. Um, and I was barricaded because after my speech, um, an ambush of people entered into the classroom, turned off the lights, they attacked me. Um, I got escorted out of the room and immediately pushed into that room that we saw on the video and I was trapped in there for three hours. Yeah, it's just un it's unbelievable what happened to you and even more unbelievable the aftermath and how these people are getting away with it. We're having a discussion about biology and by bio and you know biological things here. I think about you Louie and you are a man a husband to her and I'm sure it was just killing you that you couldn't protect your wife throughout this. What's your reaction? You know it it makes you sad it makes you mad it makes you frustrated and you feel helpless. You know, yeah. being on the phone, listening to what sounded like 
You know, it sounded like a zoo outside. People were banging on the doors, you know. To say that it makes you, I, I was shaking that I was that upset, that I was that angry, that helpless. And you know, yeah. it's, it's one of the two most important women in your life and you can't do anything, you know. I, was, I called San Francisco police. They said it's a campus issue. You know, we can't help you. I called the San Francisco uh, student, uh, the campus police. They said, you know, after 40 minutes of her being locked up in this room, the dispatch lady had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. So, you know, it, it's just, yeah. oh, the it's upsetting. And it's a pattern. This happened at another university with pro-life. A pro-life speech was given, and they, you know, hauled out the pro-lifers pro instead of the people who were disrupting, a, a, you know, a, an event and, and shutting down free speech. You know, Riley, as I see that video, one of the things that strikes me is I see this level of anger from these trans activists that I, I can't really put my, my finger on where it's coming from. It almost feels like it's coming from pain as well. I'm sure you've thought about it. Where is all this anger coming from? Why are they so mad at you for standing up for women's sports and biological women and their rights to spaces? Truthfully, I think these people um, resort to anger both verbally and physically and violence because they know they don't have reason on their side. Mm. They cannot debate me with logic or science or any kind of data that supports their argument. So they resort to personal attacks. They resort to calling me names like transphobe, which truly has no meaning anymore. That word has been devalued. If it makes me transphobic to say that men and women are different when it comes to something um, that requires strength, that's insane. And so they resort to locking me in a room and terrorizing me and my family and these officers for three hours. Yeah. Louis, uh, your brave wife, um, who is amazing, who we all admire so much, has said um, in other interviews that she is determined that she will not be silenced, that this, these kinds of attacks will force her, um, will encourage her to continue in this battle. You see what the repercussions are. Um, how do you feel about that? You know, it's, that's just, that's what, you, that's what you love about her. That's what everybody loves about yeah. her, everybody in the country. She's so strong. You know, this is, this is poured gasoline on the fire. Like she said last night, this is going to make her scream even louder. She's going to make more noise. She's going to keep fighting harder. You know, they, they've, they've given her more drive than she had before, which, as her husband, I didn't know that there was any more for anybody. So just wanted to show that so allowing chaos that was something that we brought up that was something that joe rogan brought up the police actually said to her the people that were with her said we can't be seen as anything but an ally to this group that's attacking you allowing the chaos now why are they doing that well it's because defund the police police are demons they're terrible people they were neutered they were handcuffed basically they can't do much because every time they do anything, it's a huge problem. That's how allowing chaos and demonizing order works. You have to put them into that position. And they were pushed down, buck broken into that position heavily to the point where now they allow looting in certain places, many places. So I just wanted to show that last thing. And who's 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 responsible for that? Again, it's the left. There's a connection between all these things. And again, you can't point any one finger anywhere, but I simply call it the attack within. There is there is clearly an attack within. And when you are a part of a cult, and this is the thing with Riley Gaines, when you are a part of a cult, anyone who is talking common sense is an enemy because common sense wakes people up. Everybody who's a part of this cult is in a slumber. That's the whole thing with mass formation. You're in this slumber. And every time someone speaks up, it shakes people awake a little bit. And the more people can get shaken awake, they'll actually wake up. Like Chris Rufo did, like Thomas Sowell did. They'll wake up and they'll be like, oh, wait, whoa, what was I doing? Oh my gosh. But when you can silence all of those common sense dissenting voices, when you can silence all of them, it allows the mob, it allows the cult to just fall deeper and deeper into sleep. And what is the end result again? Like with everything, the thing is not the thing. What is the end result in every single thing that we've talked about? People in power, staying in power and gaining more power, more control. Anyways, guys, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And other than that, I'm out.